Hello, thanks for joining us today. My name is Mark Eddington and I'm a member of the Developer Tools Group. Um, I've been working with Embarcadero, CodeGear, Borland, Inprise, Borland for close to 20 years now. Started out working on Quattro Pro, later on moved into working on Turbo Pascal in QA, and then I joined the Delphi R&D team in Delphi Two Days. I've worked on a variety of different areas in the product. Um, for the last few releases, I've worked primarily on improving performance and quality in the product. And uh, as part of my job, I do a lot of debugging, so I was hoping today to share some of the tools and techniques that I've worked with recently that I find very helpful. So first I'm going to briefly go over some of the tools that I highly recommend, and then I'm going to give a demo, a rather longish demo, of using the Trace Profiler, and then another quick demo of some of the differences between debug memory managers and how to use them. And then finally we'll take some questions. This talk is going to be about debugging. It doesn't go into anything really terribly low level. Um, it is helpful for having some understanding of the Windows API, but that's not requirement. Let's go on here. So tools. Um, in terms of profilers, um, AQ time is pretty much the only profiler that really fully supports Delphi in our product lines and our debug info, so it's the de facto standard as far as I'm concerned. It works very well, and it's got the capability for doing performance profiling, dysfunction trace profiling, allocation profiling, and a number of other profilers as well, which I've never even used. And then there's the memory diagnostic tools, which I use on a regular basis as well. There's the FastMM memory manager, where in debug mode is useful for finding all kinds of problems, and then there's another memory manager called SafeMM, which uh, will be available on Code Central, which I'm going to be demonstrating. And then uh, in terms of just general uh, diagnostics that don't necessarily have anything to do with programming, I highly recommend Process Explorer. It's just indispensable for diagnosing performance problems with computers, uh, trying to figure out what it's doing when you don't know what it's doing, anything like that. So if you don't have Process Explorer and you haven't replaced the task manager with it, I, I strongly encourage you to do that. The process monitor tool is also from SysInternals. It will allow you to you know, track registry writes, file read writes, things like that, and it's very useful for debugging as well. And then finally, there's a tool that actually comes with the operating system, the PerfMon tool, performance monitor, which is also very useful as well. The first demo that we're going to be giving is uh, the trace profiler demo. And the trace profiler is really useful for situations that don't lend themselves well to traditional debugging. A good example of that is what I'll be showing is when you have to do something that involves using the mouse. If you have to drag something around, it's difficult to break into the debugger and not lose the context of the drag operation. In those situations, rather than resorting to using output debug string, or setting up breakpoints that just log messages, it's very useful to be able to get a picture of what's happening under the trace profiler. It also provides static stacks that can be easily compared and that are very useful. There are going to be three parts of this trace profiler demo. In the first part, we'll just show you how to get your application up and running under AQ time and gather basic results and compare your data. And then in the next section, we'll dive a little bit deeper and show you some of the more powerful features for refining your results. And then finally, in the last section, we're going to go switch over to the function trace profiler and show you how to use that to get a very precise picture of what the code is doing. Let's take a quick look at the program that we're going to be profiling. This application shows a painting problem which occurs when running under Windows Vista. So here I'm going to go ahead and click on this toolbar and drag it. And hopefully this shows up on the video, but rather than moving, the toolbar is actually kind of disappearing as I'm dragging it. And you can see that the caption is flickering really badly. If we look down here in the tray, we can see that we were chewing up quite a bit of CPU. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at that under Process Explorer. And we look, here's our application. Bring up the performance graph. And sure enough, we can see that telltale sign of a performance problem. We've actually pegged out one of the two cores on this machine. Um, the green indicates time that's being spent in user code, which is code in your application. And the red indicates time that's being spent in the kernel. So th in this particular instance, this performance problem is a mixture of uh, the two. Very often with performance problems, you'll notice that uh, there's a lot of green and not very much red. But that's not the case with this bug. So let's go ahead and shut this application down, and we'll switch over to AQ time at this point. 
and we're going to go ahead and start a new project with that program. So I'll do a new project for module, which is quicker than just doing a new project. And we'll pick our application. Now this is a, everything is combined in a single application, so we're basically set up and ready to go at this point. But if we were doing a, a more sophisticated application, we may need to add additional modules, DLLs, packages, etc. But we don't need to do that. You also, as a point, make sure that you compile your application with debug info, otherwise you'll get an error when you try to load it in the modules. That it'll tell you that there's no debug information. You'll set that option on the linker tab in the IDE. So at this point we're basically ready to profile. We only want to profile what's happening while we're dragging the toolbar, so rather than just running now, I'm going to actually disable the profiler first globally with that option, with that toolbar, and then I'm going to run. Now the application's ready to be profiled, so I'm going to switch back to AQ time and enable the profiler, switch back to the app, drag the toolbar around a little bit, and then finally switch back to AQ time, disable the profiler again. Now this camera here will give me the results, so we're going to get some results. And then I'm done with the application at this point, so I'm going to go ahead and kill it. The results will show us the routines that are being called, and then the time each routine took, and the time that it took with all the routines that it called, and then how many times each routine was called in the hit count column. Typically when you're looking at performance problems, the most interesting column to sort by is this time with children column. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to right click here and say sort descending. And make sure we're up at the top of the scroll bar. Now you'll see things at the top here, this wait message, T application process message. Those are things that um, the wait message in particular result of us switching back and forth between the application. We're not really interested in that. But if we keep looking down here, we'll finally see mouse move. Okay, that's really what we want to start looking. We can see we spent a little over a second in the mouse move code path. So we know that something's going on there and that and that's where we're going to want to look. We don't really have enough information at this point. We can look at the call tree to see what mouse move is calling and we can start trying to diagnose the problem with just this amount of information. But when you have a situation where you can compare results, it's always easier to get a picture that way. So in this case, we're lucky because this problem only occurs when the application with the toolbar is actually in a maximized state. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run the application again. And now I'm going to restore it so it's no longer maximized. Go ahead and enable the profiler. And then do the test again. And disable the profiler and get results. Now I'm going to go ahead and kill it again. Now at this point I've got two sets of results so I can begin to compare them. But before I do that I always recommend if you're working with AQ time these results will start to stack up and it's easy to lose track of which one was associated with which. So I've gotten into the habit of always labeling them so I know which ones are which. The first run that I did was this one here on the bottom so I'm going to go ahead and label this one as max and I'm going to label this one as normal. Okay, and now what we want to compare is, there's in this case, the routines from the main thread, which was the only thread in the application. So what we'll need to do to compare is multi-select these two threads. And depending on what order you multi-select them in is the order in which they'll occur. So I'm going to select the slow maximize case first, and then multi-select the normal case second. Now I'll right-click and choose Compare. Now this, by default, is going to bring up, the first time you use is going to bring up this compare settings dialog. And what you're going to want to typically pick in here is you're going to want to compare or have it show you the routine name. And then you'll want to compare the hit count is often very useful. And the time and the time with children are also other things that you typically want to compare. So I'll go ahead and go with this set of compare results. And now here we have the comparisons. And again, this is sorted by... Um, actually, it's not clear which one it's sorted by, but what we're going to want to look at is what was slow before. So we'll go to the slow case results, and we'll sort descending here. And now at this point, scroll back up to the top and look for our mouse move, which was near the top. Here it is. And sure enough, if we look at this comparison, we can see that there's a huge difference in the hit count as well as a huge difference in the time. I mean, it's literally 100 times slower to do that mouse move operation. So what we'll want to do at this point is start to narrow these results down a little bit more because what we're comparing here is um, we're not comparing the same amount of mouse move drag time so we can't even get a, a, a one for one comparison so we're gonna we're gonna what we're gonna do in the next phase is I'll show you how to use some of the more advanced features in AQ time to allow us to see just one set of results and also not require us to have to switch back and forth and enable and disable the profiler manually so that'll be coming up next
Now that we've covered the basics of getting results and comparing them, let's take a look at some of the options for reducing the amount of data that we're returning in a result set and controlling when we get the data. First thing, in this case, since we're interested while the toolbar is being dragged, what we can do is we can use the Actions feature, which will allow us to turn the um, profiler on and off. So we can create an action, which is what I'll do right now, to enable profiling, and we'll call that Action Enable. And now on the mouse up, we want to do something similar. So let's go find the mouse up method. And again, right click and choose add to a new action. And this one we'll call disable. And choose the disable option. So now if we go and look at our setup, we've got these two new actions there are added for us. So we will end up enabling the on the mouse up, mouse down, and disabling on the mouse up. So with these in place, we don't we no longer need to have this option checked, which is the which will tell the profiler to begin profiling from the beginning of the run. So we're going to want to uncheck that. So we only profile during this window. And we won't as we were doing before, we won't need to use this global option to disable the profiler and switch back and forth. So let's go ahead and run. Drag our toolbar and shut down. Now, results are generated automatically when you shut down, so we don't have to do the get results anymore either. Um, and if we look at the results, we're still sorted by time by children. We'll see, here's the mouse move, which we've sort of discovered previously is where we need to start looking. And it was called 571 times. Problem is, is that we're not going to be able to compare these results consistently because we, can't, we don't have any control over how many times this WM mouse move will be called. It'll always be some variation no matter how consistently you drag the toolbar. So what we really want to use instead of actions are triggers. Now as luck would have it, this WM mouse move is actually called in response to the mouse down. And if we use a trigger instead of actions, we can control how many times we profile this routine. So what we'll do is we'll go back to our setup tab and I'm going to add a trigger. And we'll call this one, um, and what we want to do is use this work count feature, which will allow us to only profile a certain number of routines. And we'll just set it to one, because that should be enough for us to compare with. Now we can drag the uh, mouse down method from the enable and put it in this trigger instead. And since we're not using actions anymore, we can just get rid of this mouse up here. And so now when we run and drag the toolbar and shut down, we're going to see something very different. So now this time, we see the mouse down and we saw that it was called once. Now our times are zero here because we're doing such a small operation that it doesn't show anything. So at this point, what we're going to want to do is switch from seconds to milliseconds so that we can actually look at the data and compare it. So now we've got a set of results with the window maximized. Let's go ahead and get another set of results with it not maximized. We can go ahead and remove these before we get confused. This is the set with the actions. And I'm going to label this one. I'll call this one max1. One. And we'll run again. And restore. And drag. And now let's label this so we don't forget. And now we have two different sets of results to compare. We can look right away. We can see the time is significantly different. And we can compare. And if we look from the mouse down, we can see that it's the difference in time is 83, actually 0.83 milliseconds versus 0.12 milliseconds. So it's a significant difference. Um, and if we scroll through the results, we can begin to look for some of the differences in, in how many times things are called. And here's here's one of the obvious things that jumps right out at us is the fact that this non-client paint routine, which is what paints the title bar of the window, uh, is being called in the maximize case, but it's not being called in the minimize case. So let's take a closer look at the maximized results and see if we can figure out why the non-client paint routine is being called. First, let's take a look at the call graph. We'll go to the non-client routine in the in the results. We can see it here showing up where it's been called. If we trace back up through the call chain, we get back to the win procs, which are called for all of the Windows messages in, in the whole system. So looking at the call graph, there's actually no easy way 
to trace back to where it was called with, and know with certainty that that's who called it. So we can also look at the call tree, which will show us as well if we call look for the parents and begin to expand here. We can see that we get to a set window pause. But there were more than six set window pause calls, so we don't really have a clear picture of which set window pause call caused it to be called or exactly why. We can see that there's an adjust size call here, but even that has two calls into it. So at this point, in order to get a more exact picture of what's going on, we're going to want to jump into the function trace profiler. But before we do that, let me just show you a little bit about areas and how to exclude things from the results because eventually what we're going to want to do is get rid of some of these win procs and things like that that end up sort of getting in the way of what's happening because they're called from so many different places and if we take those out of the picture then we won't need to traverse through them. So let me just quickly show you how you can use the areas feature to include or exclude specific things from your project. So as I mentioned already these uh, wind proc routines tend to be, create noise for us as we're trying to walk through the stack. So what we can do is as we were adding things to an action, we can just go and select these in the results. We're actually interested in getting rid of pretty much all of this stuff. So we can multi-select these things, right click on them, add selected to setup, and a new area, and we will call this excluded routines, and choose excluding and say OK. And now if we go back to our Setup tab again, we'll see we have this excluded routines with all of these various things that kind of just end up becoming noise in our call stack and that make it harder to traverse because we're really not interested in those calls. I'm also going to quickly show you another view of the results, which I haven't shown you so far, which is the source files view. And this allows us to see what percentage of our time we're spending in different units. Now we know that what the code that we're interested in is in controls.pass and some of the calls that were being made are through windows.pass, but there are a couple other routines in here that are using almost no time at all that do not contain things that are really terribly interesting to us. So system.pass, graphics.pass, and classes.pass all tend to have quite a few calls in them that, but are usually not that interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and add, uh, add those to another area. And actually, in fact, I've already done that previously, so here they are in here. I can just check this checkbox. So now we've excluded some routines and excluded some areas. So I'm going to run one more time just so that we can quickly have a look at how the call stacks look different now. Drag it again, shut it down, and now when we go to look at our results, if we go to our set window pause call and our non-client paint call, we can see there's a one-to-one -one correlation. Okay, it's very clear now that the set window pause call called the non-client paint call. And if we go to the call tree, we select the set window pause call and go to the call tree, we can see the set window call, if we look at its children, it's calling these routines, this non-client paint, and all of these other routines. Now, what we don't see here is the order in which those things are called, or why they were called for that matter. So we're going to switch over now to the trace profiler and see if we can get just a few little bit more information before we t tackle this bug. Okay, I've gone ahead and generated a new set of results with the excluded areas and routines that we just went over. Um, so right now if we go in and look at the compared results, we can use the filtering capability to see which routines are being called in the maximize case and not in the non-maximize case. So I'm going to use one of the predefined filters for blanks here. So R1 in this case is the maximize case. So we can see that all of these routines are being called in the maximize case, but not in the ma other maximize case. So frequently, we have a pretty good idea at this point what's going wrong. Um, and then we know that it has to do with the set window pause call. But when you're debugging a problem like this, it's it's often very useful to be able to identify exactly where the two code paths diverge. So that's where the function trace profiler is going to come into play. So at this point, what I'm going to do is clear those results from the mer compare, and we'll switch the current profiler over to the function trace profiler. And then we're going to go ahead and run. This will be exactly the same as previously, so I'm going to pause this while I run real quick and gather the results. OK, I've gathered two sets of results, the maximize case and the normal case. And here we're looking at the maximize results. You notice these look a little different than under the performance profiler because it's going to be one entry for every call that was made. Um, this call number column. And then there's no hit count, obviously, since each one of these is a single hit. 
Um, so just as before, what we're going to want to do at this point is compare the two set of results. In the compare settings, we're going to want to set those up initially as well. You're going to want to have the call number be an info column, and then the routine name and the parent name both as compare columns. Now there's no different style for those. It'll just list those. So we, having set those up, we're going to go ahead and compare them. Now at this point, if the two code paths didn't diverge at all, we wouldn't see any differences anywhere in this entire compare set. If we scroll down to the end, we'll see that the maximized case has 458 entries, whereas the um, non-maximized case has 425. So all we have to do now is just page back through these results until we find where the two code paths diverged. And if we look here at, at line 412, we can see that this WM non-calc size was called in this case, whereas this one called request align. And we see that the set window pause is where the call was made. So in this way, we can this this is just really just another view of what we were just going over with the performance profiler, but it pinpoints exactly where the, the non-calc call was called. So the last thing I'm going to do real quick is, is show you the tree view of the set window pause calls. So I'm going to go look at the maximize case, and we want to go find the set window pause call. Now you'll see in the first case, it does only a window pause changing down here. So we know that there's two calls. Let's look for the second one. Okay, now we're on the second one. Okay, here we go. So in the tree view now, we can see with, with all those excluded routines, we can see very clearly what, what happened. So the, the set window pause call, which is a Windows API, resulted in a number of Windows messages being generated, which the application then responded to. It, it did the window pause changing, and then all of these other routines happened. Um, whereas if we go and look at the non-maximized case, this is the same call where we lined up. It does only the window pause changing. So the behavior of the set window pause call changed in the maximized window case under Windows Vista. Um, it's a, it has to do with the theming and the painting of the title bar, presumably. But we had to make adjustments into the VCL to eliminate this painting problem. And, the fix ended up being just simply avoiding the set window pause call in the case where there has not been any change in the windows position. So if you look in controls.pass, you'll see that under um, Delphi 2009 and later in controls.pass, there is a new do adjust size routine, which is checking whether or not we actually need to do any work before doing it. So that's it for this demo. Okay, let's talk a little bit about debugging memory issues. There's two primary types of memory issues that come up that we work on. There's heap corruption issues which occur more often than not when somebody's accessing some memory that has been freed already, but not always. And then the other thing that will cause heap corruption is if there's some code executing on multiple threads that is not thread safe, it will often leave memory in a corrupted state. The other common type of memory issue is memory leaks. Of course, there's the obvious missing free call when you have a, an object that's uh, been allocated, lists getting filled up and then not being cleared out. And then another fairly common cause of memory leaks is uh, interface references that are never released because the reference count on the interface does not end up going back to zero. Those are some of the common types of memory issues that we've worked on. Okay, so in terms of identifying heap corruption, FastMM running in the debug mode is one of the most effective ways of finding it. Very often heap corruption is non-deterministic, meaning depending on what data got written into the heap or written overwritten somewhere, you may or may not see a failure, and typically if you do see a failure, it will be random different every time. So FastMM is very helpful for identifying those because in most cases you can just run with it full time during the field test cycle actually for uh, Rad Studio 2010 we had the field testers running with the debug memory manager for most of the first part of it. The de internal developing team runs with it on full time all the time and it, whenever a memory issue comes up it's nice to have it there because it will give you the information that you need to identify the problems. SafeMM is another memory manager which is not generally available but I'll be making it available on Code Central. It was written by Ben Taylor uh, one of our field testers in the past. It uses a slightly different mechanism than FastMM. It page protects memory, so it can detect when you write past the end of a memory block or uh, in front of a memory block, and it can immediately detect when somebody's accessed freed memory. So it's 
in certain situations, it's more useful than FastMM at finding the source of the problem. FastMM tends to detect problems slightly after the fact, which makes it a little bit more work to get to the root of the problem. AQ time also includes heat detection, but I won't be talking about that. And it's an external requirement. Both SafeMM and FastMM are freely available. In terms of figuring out if you have a memory leak, um, there's a couple of good ways to do it. The performance monitor, which I mentioned at the beginning, comes with the OS. You can set it up to monitor any of the different memory types that your application can be using, private bytes, virtual memory, working set, those types of things. And you can have it running and leave it running and it'll show you a graph and it's very easy. Process Explorer is also excellent for that as well. The, the memory graph which I showed, the performance graph actually, which I showed earlier in the, um, the demo of the trace profiler, will also show you as the memory's going up. So, and you don't have to do any setup with that. With the performance monitor, you have to do a little bit of setup. And then finally, FastMM is really excellent for using in unit tests. We use it in our unit tests in the database area of the product to detect if somebody makes code change that introduces a memory leak, it'll be caught and reported as a failure immediately in the test. Uh, whereas Process Monitor and Process Explorer are obviously things that are interactive that you would use when you're trying to reproduce a memory leak by following a set of steps. So let's go ahead and we will jump into the Debug Memory Manager demo. Now I'm going to use this little test application to show you how to use the debug memory managers and also some of the differences between FastMM and SafeMM. This, this particular test uses a, a point object and the main form will have an array of points which it will um, create the points and then free the points. Let me just take a quick look down at the code here. Here we're allocating the array, creating the point instances, and then finally we clear everything out down here. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and run this application without any debug memory manager configured so that we can see if it detects any errors. There are a couple of errors here that you can see annotated in the source. So let's go ahead and run. And we'll click the button and nothing happened. So let's go back and enable debug memory manager. So first we're going to enable the FastMM debug memory manager. I'm just going to uncomment this line of code which will cause FastMM to be brought in. When you enable the memory manager, the debug memory manager, you're going to want to make sure that that's the first unit in your users clause. Um, so now that it's enabled, I'm going to go ahead and run again and click the button. Now this time we get the FastMM error dialog. Um, when, this, when this dialog cups, comes up, it'll show you what the error was that occurred, and then typically it'll have three stacks. The first stack will be the code path leading up to the allocation. The second stack is where the uh, memory was freed, and then the third stack is the code path actually leading up to the error. So in this case, we see that we did a dyn array set length. We were allocating the array when the memory was allocating. And then since it was an error during the free mem operation, the stack leading up to the free doesn't apply here and this is actually memory that was previously associated with this block. And then this final stack down here, if we look at it, we can actually figure out where it failed. So we'll see free mem call, binary clear call, and then finally the T form one button one click is the one that's in our code. So let's go take a look at that line 96 of, of our main form and it, we should see that that's where the error is occurring. And then line 96 is where we're actually freeing the array. So by assigning, uh, assigning the nil value to the array, we're, we're freeing it. So FastMMM does catch the error in this case, but it didn't catch the error. The actual error occurred up here because we were missing the minus 1, and we wrote 1 beyond the end of the array. So now I'm going to go ahead and show you the difference, one of the differences between the way FastMM will detect error and SafeMM detects errors. So I'm going to do a program reset here and now I'm going to enable the SafeMM memory manager instead of FastMM. And we'll run again and click the button. Now this time we actually get an AV, we don't get an error dialog. That's one of the things I should mention about SafeMM. You have to use it under the debugger so that the debugger can catch the access violation which is generated in response to any memory error that, which may be detected. So here we'll actually see, if we look at the call stack, the count is i is 10 and count is 10. So we've since it's zero base, we've read off the end of the array, or we've written off the end of the array, which is what caused the um, error. 
So now that we've identified what that error is, I'm going to go ahead and do a program reset here and go ahead and fix this error so that we can move on and show you one of the next differences. So I'll go ahead and re-enable the FastMM and run again. Now this time I'm going to go ahead and click the button. Now we didn't get any error this time, but there was in fact an error. So I'm going to go ahead and shut down and switch them back again and run again. Now this time we're going to get an access violation from SafeMM and if we look it'll point us at the next error which is on this line of code here we're reading beyond the end of the array. The conditions here should have been reversed so that we actually validate the, the index of the array before we try and use it. So that's a, that's a very subtle kind of programming error that, that typically will go undetected because you're just reading from memory and not writing to it and in this case it's just four bytes and so it ends up being in most cases it ends up being harmless but it certainly can cause problems in s specific circumstances where the memory is uninitialized and you get unexpected behavior because of that so I'm gonna go ahead and do a program reset again and now I'm gonna just go ahead and fix this error so we can move on so now with that's fixed the program will run correctly with all all three memory managers okay the next thing I'm gonna show you is um, how the differences in, in detecting uh, access to memory that's already been freed. So here I'm going to use this other data variable, flast point, to point to one of the members of the array. And then later on down here I'm going to detect whether or not it's, it's been initialized and if it is I'm going to try to access it. So at this point now I'm going to switch back to the FastMM debug memory manager and run again. And when I click the button, now this time we got a different FastMM error dialog, and, and what it's it's what it's done is it's uh, set up the virtual method table so that it knows when somebody tries to call a free ob uh, object. In this case, the the method that was being called was virtual, so it was able to detect that the call was being made on a freed object. Now I'm going to go ahead and re-enable the safe MM manager to demonstrate what that will do in this case. click the button, get an AV, and click break. So here, instead of having a, an error message that pops up from a dialog, in this case, the actual access in the code where it's actually trying to read from F last point, it's going to end up being pointing, this is now pointing to memory that's no longer accessible. We can see these inaccessible values here. So that memory is actually page protected, so it can no longer access those things. So depending on what situation you're in, both will work well. This, even if the accessor for X, in this case, was a virtual method, if it wasn't virtual, safe MM would still detect this error, but fast MM would not. Okay, and there's one last thing I want to show you with regards to this memory manager. So go ahead and do a program reset here, and get rid of this line of code, and add this one, which is going to give us a memory leak, because I'm creating another instance of the object, but I'm never going to free it. So in this case, we'll switch back to the FastMM memory manager. Well, actually, let's leave the SafeMM and just run this. And we'll click the button and see nothing happens there. And nothing happens when we shut down. So I'll switch over to the FastMM memory manager, click the button, and shut down. Now FastMM puts up a different dialog, which is basically giving us a report about what was leaked. And it'll actually tell us the size of the leak and if it's an object and it has the correct information and it will tell you what the name of the object was. So that's it for this memory demo. Okay, well that pretty much wraps up what I've got to talk about today. These are a few of the resources, links to some of the things that I talked about in my talk and a few things that I didn't. The application verifier and uh, some of these books are of interest, maybe of interest to you if you want to go a little deeper with some of the debugging that you do. So without further ado, we will take your questions. Thanks.